So uh, basically today is going to be to present what we have been doing for the past two and a half years now nearly on what we affectionately call between us the GECP, which is the Greater Etosha Carnival Program. And that's basically um, a large scale collaborative project program actually that is jointly led by the Ecology Etosha Ecological Institute and the Ongava Research Center. And that's basically the broad question is studying carnivores in a changing world. How that started, it started when Werner Killian was still the head of the, the EI. And then one day it was Chloe sat us down and he said, well, would you want to lead a large carnival, well, a carnival program in Etosha because we need to know more about them. To which we replied, wait, let us sit down and you can ask that question again because we couldn't believe our ears. And so we said, sure, we are really keen so that that's basically to put the, the emphasis that it was basically an EI initiative and that that program is really jointly led by EI and ORC. So what do we mean by um, a changing world? Well, basically we're looking in a huge global change across, uh, across the, the planet with increases in the human population, but also in our activity and infra infrastructure and basically everything that is related to, to us. And concomitantly to that, we usually notice a decrease in the um, protected area uh, area across across the world. That is also true with Etosha. You can see at the top that the evolution of Etosha National Park size, shape or shape and size, basically. And then in parallel to that, we are today knowing that most of the carnival, most um, there's a huge decrease in in uh, wildlife population abundance and especially for carnivores here is just the five large carnivores of of Africa we do not have any wild dogs in Etosha uh, at the moment it used to be but basically all those uh, population are, are decreasing except maybe for the brown hyena we are busy revisiting now with the IUCN's um, hyena special species um, species socialist specialist group sorry the the distribution and numbers of the four species of hyenas in the world. And it seems that at least in Namibia, there is a possibility for the spot for the brown hyena population to be on the increased size that yet, that's yet to be confirmed. But basically all those large carnivores, I've seen the population dramatically decreasing over time. Uh, the conservation status is also increasing in the, the vulnerability. And then in parallel to that, uh, which is really uh, impressive and a real problem is that they are losing a lot of their range. So hyena spotted in brown are the one who lost the, the least, most probably because they are very adaptable species and they can still live in quite close proximity to us and are very um, adaptable and flexible. But when we look at basically the, the, the cheetah, the wild dogs and the lion, I mean, the lion lost nearly 94% of its formal range. That is that is absolutely huge. And now most, most of these species are mainly, if not only restricted to protected area. So the protected area in which which constitute right now the core of our study area are really the, the source of the, um, the large carnival population. So our framework within the GECP, it's basically trying to understand what drives and limits the abundance and distribution of carnivores in the landscape. So ultimately, this is most probably going to lead to looking down at the, are those population limited by or influenced by bottom up or top down processes. But basically, to answer those questions, we need to look at the carnivores fitness, which is basically linked to their survival and their recruitment. So for non ecologist people here, survival is basically how long an animal survive in the landscape and recruitment is how many new individuals are added to the population. So it's basically looking at the babies that are born, do they actually reach adulthood and so reproductive, uh, take part in the reproductive part of the population. There's a lot of drivers that influence that fitness. Uh, then this list is non-exhaustive, but that's the, the factors that we are actually particularly interested in uh, in our program. And so that's basically looking at food and water, that is resources for those animals, disease that's mainly limiting factors, genetic diversity and gene flow within that population, but also with population adjacent to us, the intra-guild interaction, so that's within the carnivores, how they interact with each other. And obviously, even though it's the last day, it's definitely not the least, is how human us are playing a huge role in their distribution and abundance at the moment. 
Factors to be measured, there's just really just barely really example. We're gonna look at water availability, rainfall, habitat quality, presence and abundance of prey, looking at which disease we can find, the genetic diversity, how they interact with each other, mainly looking at uh, with GPS colors and direct observation, and the interaction with humans. So that's obviously range from mortality from those carnivores, but also how they cross the fence and their feeling and a perception of humans towards those carnivores. The landscape we are working on is the Greater Etosha, what we call the Greater Etosha landscape. Affectionately also, we name it the gel. So that's basically composed at the heart of the Etosha National Park, which is about 23,000 square kilometers. And then within a 40 kilometer buffer, there's basically a mosaic of private, uh, private free old farmland to the south and the west of Etosha, separated with it, uh, with the Tosha from by the veterinary fence, on the eastern, on the western, sorry, and northern side of the fence of the Tosha fence, this is mainly communal land. So that's also set on human settlement, but also communal conservancies. And if we add that forty kilometer buffer to the Tosha National Park area, then we basically talking about working in a landscape that is fifty nine, nearly fifty nine thousand square kilometers. This is huge. Uh, this is very difficult to, to cover, obviously. So we can't do, we're not even planning on doing everything, but for sure we can't even do something everywhere. So it means that in this landscape, we cannot know everything that's going on everywhere. There's gonna be area of, of special focus. And from there, we hope to derive conclusion and uh, lessons for the whole landscape. Up to now, I've been talking about large carnivores, but of course we do not have only large carnivores in the landscape, and we are not interested only in large carnivores. So we're actually looking at the five species of large carnivores in the in the area. We do count brown hyena as a carnivore. It is a carnivore. It's usually not considered as a predator, but definitely a carnivore that has a huge role to play in the scavenging ecology um, in this area. We've got five species of what we call medium-sized carnivores. Hard wolf, jackal, blackback jackal, only caracal, serval, and honey badgers. I mean, serval in the area are probably not very common and non numerous, but they, they do exist. So we also need to include them. Honey badger is one of my favorite. There's a lot of things that we don't know about them, and I would be very interested to, to study them a bit more. And then three species of small carnivores, battered foxes, cape fox, and African wildcats. Um, Martina Kutze will tell you that here we do not have black footed cats. It's yet to remain to be proven that they are here. But for now, we just look at one uh, species of small cats. So when we talk about the Greater Etosha Carnivore Program, we're not talking about the Etosha Large Carnivore Program. We really want to have a holistic approach. And even though at the moment we are definitely concentrating on the, the, three, uh, the three big one, which is basically the lion, the spotted iron, and the leopard, we really want ultimately to work with, with all of them. OK, so what, are we, what we've done so far? Well, let me just give you first a few numbers. So the GCP is basically composed of seven research partners, two local uh, at, the, at the top there, this is the one that basically coordinating the whole program is the EI and, and us. And the two local university, UNAM and NAST, a local partner as well, NGO, which is the Namibian Lion Trust that operates in the Western side of Etosha, outside of Etosha. And then international universities, main partner being the University of Georgia through Jim Beasley, the um, uh, IZW through Jörg and uh, Bettina, and then the University of Ljubljana to Mia. For all of you who don't know the name, I'll just drop them here. So then you can uh, uh, have those person pinned down somewhere. Okay. We are at the moment training five students, which includes two PhD students. So here you've got someone that you know all very well, Maddy, Reese, who just left us, Jesse. So all of these three are part of the UGA team. Jesse is right now writing a comms for um, PhD. Here we've got Joseph, who is a master's student from uh, NUST with us. We've got Doug, who is a, a PhD student with IZW. And here we've got uh, UNAM vets uh, students. So we have trained basically more than 30, 30 of these guys. They usually join us once or twice a year for the capture coloring operation. So they get the, they get the practical during the day when we sleep. Uh, no, sorry, when we process sample, they actually usually go out and, and dart uh, um, ungulates, so zebra, springbok. And at night, there's no rest for the wicked. They're just coming with us and shoot lions and hyenas and whatever we can so we can stick collars on them. 
So far, all are within between all the partners, we've got 46 satellite collars that are deployed and it's been collected more than 500,000 uh, uh, 500, GPS location. So here, that's not all of the animals that are that are deployed. Some of you might rec or might recognize that image that's used on the poster that Reese has been developing. In kind of yellow, you've got the lions. In what is supposed to be blue, uh, are the hyenas. I removed some individuals to make to to clarify a bit the map. But basically, we cover almost the integrity of of Etosha. Well, and nothing much happens in the pan. Here we have a big uh, black blank spot that we actually have no idea what's happening here. And we know that there's quite a lot of conflict opening in that border. So we'll we'll have to go and look in here. Uh, and here the same, uh, we don't have much. We don't have much hyenas here, but we've got historical data. And by the end of the year, we're planning to go and deploy some hyena collars here and some also hyena collars here. We've got more than 700 biological samples that have been collected so far. Most of them are stored um, at ORC. Another, another part of them is stored in liquid nitrogen and IZW. I'll give you a bit more details about those later. We've got more than 100 camera traps that are deployed across Etosha and its fence. So here, that's only the camera trap grid that I show here. But maddie has got camera trap deployed on the fence, uh, on the western fence, on uh, Styrus somewhere here, on Ongava and on Guma here, and then on the northeastern border. And basically, so far, all those camera traps images are uploaded to Trap Tiger, our uh, famous partner for camera trap images. And we've got more than 1 million already camera trap um, images classified. Was that great? It keeps us busy, I can tell you that. So, so far, what we've done a bit more detail, we started the project with a carnivore research stock date. We wanted to know what was known about carnivores in general in the area. So we looked in the published literature. We looked at the Tusha Ecological Archives, spent a couple of days in the Okakuyo jail, which is where they store the archives, going through very, very old paper and finding like it's a gold mine. It's really amazing. And we found basically 139 historical studies um, that, were, that were useful for us. What we found is like most of the research has been conducted. So the, the research span basically is from a century ago to, to now, to 2020. That was when we stopped the, or 21, that's when we stopped the, the literature search. Most of the research has been concentrated in Etosha, 117 studies. And most of them are basically looking at ecology. There is a very little uh, study on methods and on applied ecology either. There is also huge variation between species. You can see that a lot of the of the work has been work, has been done in Etosha in green and on the bigger species, including the cheetah, and interestingly enough, the black by jackal. That's the most uh, common small or medium-sized carnivore in our area. And then on the theme as well, you can see that there is a clear, clear trend to, to look more at, at ecology, basically, of those animals in the, in the national park. If we look a bit more in detail, so that's basically giving you, for each species here, for each theme, uh, the number of, of study and the proportion of reference that I, that I show. So basically here, you have a lot, like most of the study on survival has been done on population and distribution, but actually we're looking at like less than five studies, okay? What we see is that for the large carnivores, we actually have a good spread. So we have data a bit, a bit everywhere, but still we mainly have mortality, demographic, spatial and feeding ecology. But when it comes to interaction or behavior or physiology, you can see that there's big gap. So there is huge gap to, to, to fill in, in uh, in the literature and still a lot of things that we don't do. I forgot to say here that that um, work has been published in Namibian Journal of Environment. Um, then the next step was to look at obviously historical data. I'm going to go quite fast on that one because the, my last seminar was on this, so I'm just going to skip that. That's all, also been published in Namibian Journal of in, uh, Environment last year. That's looking at the leopards on Ongava, so that's combining information from GPS collars here and then from camera traps and basically looking at the number of individuals we saw on Ongava, so about just um, shy of 30. We identified two parts of the population, resident and transients. And when we look at the transients, at the um, resident, sorry, 
we estimate that basically there is about 10 leopards that establish their territory on Ungava. And then the last paper that we published actually this year so far was a paper from Deepon Jan on looking at the effect of the fence, the Etosha fence on lion and hyenas uh, using historical data set from, from the EEI. And so what we looked at is basically looking at how often those colored animals cross the fence and when they were close to the fence, how did they move? Graphical summary that might also look familiar for, for some of you that was in the blog that was made by Reese, that was in the blog also a blog post that's in our website on that publication. So basically what we found is that when they were close to the fence within 500 meters, Hyenas cross 18% of the time and lion only 9% of the time. So hyenas were twice as much likely to cross than the lions were. In the lions, there were some differences as well between adult male and adult females with the male seemingly um, crossing less. Interestingly, when they go outside, they do not spend a lot of time outside. So it's not like they go and they spend days or weeks outside. They usually on average spend less than 12 hours or well, 11 13 hours. So they basically go out at night, they cross at night, they're active at night, they cross, spend the night out, and then come back inside. What's interesting is that the patterns in terms of seasonal number of crossings is that hyena seems to cross many during the wet season when the prey distribution in the park is um, the prey are the prey are more spread out, so probably more difficult to find. Um, there is also less mortality, even though there's um, the youngsters. And lions actually tried um, cross tend to cross more during the cold, cold, dry season. That might be an adjustment to going to find prey outside, um, outside, outside the park. We're not exactly too sure what's what's going on here. And the way when the animals are crossed to the fence, hyenas tend to move faster and in straighter movement, which um, points to the fact that hyenas know exactly where to cross. So they get to the fence, walk along the fence, and then and then cross the fence. Whereas lions actually tend to move faster, but more, more um, have more convoluted path, which might indicate that in the vicinity of the fence, they actually find themselves um, a bit impacted by the, the risk of encountering humans. And so basically move um, less straight and try to avoid, avoid disturbances. All right. So I said that I will give you a bit more details about the biological sampling. So, so far we've got sample from 50 lions and 14 uh, spotted hyenas. We collect blood that's gonna be used for DNA, immune system and disease analysis. Hairs, mainly used for DNA. Whiskers for isotopes, so that's mainly uh, used for diets that can, no, the whiskers can't be used for DNA because we cut them, we don't uh, plug them. Uh, feces, looking at the diet, at the microbiome, and at endoparasites, mainly for UNAM, those ones, and ectoparasites, looking at pathogen in, um, in, those, um, in those samples. So that's uh, here, that's the IZW team was O twin from UNAM collecting sample and immobilized lioness. That's our sample kits that I spend my life prepping. And that's our, that's our kit that we use. We use in the field. So this is actually a manual centrifuge. So when we go in the field, then we don't have power. We don't need a centrifuge. We can just manually centrifuge those samples. And all of those samples, or most of the samples, are stored at ORC. So that was the lab when at the, the first onset of the coloring when we deployed about 18 colors in like two weeks. Bettina moved a complete lab from IZW to ORC. So she had everything here, so she could process the samples very quickly and, and store them as she needs. So there's special protocol for, for looking at the immune system and immune responses of those, um, of those animals. All right, so that's what we've done, what we are currently busy with. So we are still coloring quite a lot of predators and ear tagging livestock, mainly in the northeastern area of the park here, that is for Joseph's um, master, master study to understand how carnivores and livestock interact outside the park. And Joseph is also conducting a lot of interviews with the local communities there to try to understand the social economical context of the interact in, the, in which the human are interacting with wildlife in that area. So here you see um, that that's Joseph's same picture I showed earlier, and that's a goat with um, an ear tag, solar ear tag, so that's satellite, okay? We receive all of that by emails. The camera trap grid is keeping us busy. I feel that the only thing I do apart from prepping sample kits is charging batteries and go in service cameras. 
So if you look a bit more in detail, we inherited that grid from uh, Wendy Turner, who was then who was at Berkeley initially when she set it up. She's now with USGS. And all those octagonal, hexagonal cameras are the initial grid. The initial grid has been running continuously since 2018, okay? Mm -hmm. Since early this year, we added all the triangle cameras um, that were bought. So some of them were still leftovers from Wendy. Some of them are, were actually bought by, by, uh, by Jim from UGA. And all of that basically is 81 camera trap running continuously, uh, emphasis continuously, which means that every six weeks, those cameras are serviced, change the battery, change camera, um, the SD cards, download the images, upload to Trap Tiger, and sort images. You can talk to Simeon and Michael about that. Uh, they know how to classify images. We are also trying to reach to raise public awareness about carnival. So not just carnival ecology, but trying to explain to people, to visitors to Etosha, why they will see many lions, few hyenas, with colors. Usually tourists do not like to see animals with colors. I am a photographer. I also hate seeing animals with colors, especially those for which the color is so obvious, like in the, in the lioness, in a lion, adornal lion, the male, the main hide it quite well. But then it's basically trying to explain to people, look, you're going to see colors, colors on animals. This is who is deploying them. This is why we are deploying them. This is what they're going to use for. And just answer basic questions a lot of people are asking. But then does that not change the behavior of the animal and those kind of things? So it's basically giving people facts about what we're doing. Those two posters were designed by Reese. We are now in the process of getting them approved for uh, putting them up in, in Etosha and in lodges around Etosha as well. So that's done the end of the EI at the moment. We are also writing a, a magazine article for, for the NCE. So that's the Namibia Conservation, I think the, the name of the magazine is. I'm actually gonna submit it today. So that was also um, spearheaded by, by Reese, and we all chipped in. So that's basically a global article on what is the GCP, who is there, what we're doing. So that's kind of a summary of what I'm, I'm telling you today. And then we've got many other ongoing projects so looking at spatial ecology of spotted hyena along a gradient of rainfall. So that's combining data from Etosha, Kodum, the Zambezi region, and Wangi National Park in collaboration with the Kwando Carnival Program and Wits University. Using the historical data on lion and hyena, we're looking at the habitat selection in Etosha. We are looking at the more in detail on the wildlife fence crossing. So that's the camera trap study led by, by Maddy. So that's Maddy setting up a camera trap here. And uh, that's one of the hard wolf uh, about to cross the fence. She's looking at carnivores, but also at other species of animals. And then we're looking at the diet as well across the landscape, not only, not only in Etosha, but we collect scats everywhere we can. And that's Jesse's PhD, uh, looking at not only lions and hyenas, those ones are lions, but obviously we do, we have a lot of cheetah and jackals cats as well. And then Doug is doing his PhD with IZW and Ljubljana on the social ecology of lions, and that includes um, spatial ecology, the oranges, how they overlap and how they meet each other, but also how they communicate with uh, vocal communication, basically. So he is busy doing, doing that in the central part of, of Etosha, so the colors range basically from Sondokop here to all the way to, to Halali. So all of those are as a W colors. All right, but that's not enough. We don't want to stop here, even though that keeps us really busy. We have a lot of other plans. So next year, that's that's big things. That's the 50th anniversary of the EEI. So we are just gonna try to celebrate that with a bang and run park-wide surveys of full species. Uh, in, so that's gonna be next year. The first one is going to be using call-up stations for lion and spotted hyenas. So we would go to all those cross spots at night and play sounds that attract lions and hyenas and count them and identify them and then come up with an estimate of the population of those carnivores that's been asked for years by MEFT. So we hope that next year we can give them an answer. And then there will be a citizen science survey for leopards and cheetahs. That will be an MSC project, probably with Michael. This, some of you might be familiar, that's the pilot study I tried to run on Ongava. It's a total failure, so I do not recommend trying it again. But the idea is basically next year, we will be really doing, doing a full-on survey. So there will be posters in Etosha, flyers, and posts on social media, and we will ask people to send us 
the pictures of the sighting so we can on each sighting identify the, anim the animals and then run um, a bit more complex models to try to estimate those guys. Some of you might ask, okay, but then why don't we do everything? Why don't we use the same methods for everyone, right? The problem is pull-up survey uh, only work for usually dominant carnivores and carnivores that are social. Leopard and cheetahs, leopard are usually solitary. Cheetahs are definitely subordinate. And both of them are not very vocal. So those guys sometimes do re respond to survey, but it's definitely to call-up. This is definitely not the right method to survey them. And then why are we not using citizen science for lions and spotted hyenas? Well, for lions, because actually in order to identify lions on pictures, you need to have very close up pictures of whisker spots and very few people are capable of, of sh sharing those pictures with us. It's, it's a bit technical. So we would basically have a small sample size, even though lions are seen often. And then for hyenas, spot patterns are not easy, but also they have any nocturnal. And guess what? The park is closed at night. So this is why we are using two different methods. This is actually the best way to do it. Just use the best method available for the species and the question you are, uh, the species you're working on and the question you're trying to answer. All right, we're also going to, on our side, a bit more concentrate on Ungava. We're going to leverage the ORC long-term camera trap data set that's been building since 2009. The first thing is just <laughs> going to be to identify every leopard on every single picture. So that's going to be quite fun. I don't know who's going to do that. I need to find someone. You can volunteer if you want. Uh, there is about, I need to think, five, there's about well, 5,000 images. That should be okay. Um, yeah, good. Thank you very much, for. I take notes of the volunteering. <laughs> um, we'll also look, once those has been identified, then we can basically know which anim animals has been seen where and when, so that we can actually look at the long longevity of those animals. For instance, we know that that leopard that was collared in 2012, it was a fully grown adult male already uh, holding a territory was still seen in 2019. So that's at least seven years. We can probably say that it was at least nine years at the time. Nine years residence, that's, that's something. So we hope that we'll have more data on more individuals to start answering that questions. And then obviously look a bit more into population ecology. So that's a picture from Maddie at the fence. As I said at the beginning, we know that we have resident and transients. We can know quite a lot about residents because, well, we're going to see them quite often. But what's going on with the transients? What's happening with, with those guys who actually cross and then spend extended amount of time on the reserve? So do they go out and we never see them again? Do they come back, pop in again two or three years later, maybe just to check if a territory is vacant and then leave again? Do they come back and then stay? So that's that's all those big questions that a long-term camera trap that I said, like the one we have can answer. And then other project, because obviously that's not enough, right? We need to keep ourselves busy. With the camera trap grid in Etosha, we really want to start focusing on smaller species. So that's going to be, which are they? Where do they occur? How often do we see them? And what basically affects where do we see them and how often we see them? Start working on disease-related question as well. There's extremely little known of which disease are actually just simply occurring in Etosha. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we know rabies with the jackals. We know anthrax. But beyond that, very, very little known. Mm -hmm. So just the first description of, okay, from all the samples we have, what pathogen do they, do they carry? Start to looking, uh, looking into uh, intra-guild interaction. We can now do that because we have colors. So we don't need to be with the animals to see what they do. We can also look at when color come close to each other. Usually when they do, it means that the animal to which the color is attached is also with the color. So they interact with each other. And one thing that we're particularly uh, really interested and excited about is testing the efficacy of a smell repellent on fence crossing behavior. And that would be a collaboration with, with the Botswana Carnival Trust. And here you can see two, two hyenas Oh, did I post it? Okay. Um, on both on each side of the fence. And just here, there is um a small container that's emitting a smell that has been artificially generated, but that smell actually is from a is um reproduction of a compound that was found in a leopard scat, so a single chemical compound. And you can see that basically that stops that hyena right in its track. Eventually they do cross. But it has been shown that some sometimes the like if the wind was coming going in that direction, leopards coming from that side would stop 
and turn around, like really completely stopping and preventing animal to cross or access areas. It has been tested as well on crawl because obviously that's also a great application trying to protect the livestock. And when there were a lot of tracks and pictures of carnivores, not so not only leopard, eh, around that crawl before setting up the repellent, after the repellent, there was virtually none. So it's just, it's really preliminary results. What we try to do is with Peter Apps is like now to, to kind of ramp it up. We this is this is interesting. Now with the master, the data from Maddie's master, we know what's going on for about a year without the smell. So we have the background data, we have the control data. Based on that data, now if we go back to the same holes and we put that ripple in there, what's gonna happen? So we really have an experimental situation where we have before and after. So that's that's an exciting project, hopefully for next year. Oof, I would need to. I would like to if I was replying to you now, but I, I have the data, so we can have a look. Yeah. No, and that's something that we hope will be also one of the topic for Brennan, our new master student who is arriving very soon now with with UGA as well. What I'd like to emphasize uh, and and give thanks to is basically the GCP is not a uh, one institution endeavor. Okay, it's uh, it really consists of a lot of research partners, and nothing could be done without ju just with one organization. It's really important for us to highlight the fact that it's really collaborative project, and we all work together. So, for instance, for now we've got uh, UGA, IZW, Ljubljana, and EI. We all have Enongava as well. We all have GPS colored data. All of that is pulled together. Everybody can access everything. So it's it's really it's it sounds logical, right? But it's actually in the world of large carnivores, it doesn't happen often. It's extremely rare that different institution, research institution, each with their own right and and um, goals and objective and funding and all of that come together and say we are going to share all our data. Same with the carnivore, the camera trap grid. Uh, at the moment, it sits on trap tagger, but if everyone was to request the data, said, okay, what do you need? Here you go. That is basically communal, communal data. This would not be possible without the AI support of two main partners. So WildEye is actually the company behind trap tagger. They're based in South Africa. They are actually completely like us, founded by philanthropy, almost. Uh, by Paul Moritz, who is basically donating a lot of his money to support that endeavor. So that's those two are completely free. Okay, we're not paying a cent for their support and for using the facility. African Carnival Wild Book is an online platform AI to identify individuals. Uh, so that's what I've been using to look at cheetah and leopards in Etosha, for instance. And then lastly, obviously, none of this happens without money, and so we've got a few sponsors. Obviously, the Ongava Game Reserve, where we are based, and we're getting uh, some in, uh, income from the visitors here. The Walter Conservation uh, Foundation as well, we set up the ORC. I don't need to give two more details on that. And also Varta with our local supplier of uh, batteries. And at the moment, just, just for the Etosha Great Fence, we have a total of 1,300 batteries that we charge, keep charge and whatever. And Varta through um, Vision Trail Marketing in Vinduk is actually sponsoring us. Not everything, but uh, they make donation every year. They also used to, to, to survey our water walls here uh, and they give us good discounts on when we buy batteries with them. So that's the thing, the key about that program is that it's really, it's just not us. It's also not just, not us with EI, it's just a lot of partners coming together to, with the same goal um, of advancing what we know about large carnivores and hoping that this knowledge that's generated there will help the conservation and improve our coexistence with them. Thank you very much. That's about it.